Hey everybody and welcome back to Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Podcast and Blast. This is Hal Herring. I have a guest today. I wanted to record a quick introduction to him so he wouldn't waste time there and embarrass him with the recounting of his exploits, uh, which are many. Uh, I'm here today with Richard Manning. I have been a fan of his work since 1992. He's an elk hunter and a uh, journalist. He's written, and probably went to my count, about nine books. But my acquaintance with his work started in 1991 or two when he published a book called The Last Stand, Logging Journalism and the Case for Humility. It's an account of uh, four years. Uh, Dick Manning worked for four years at the Missoulian newspaper in Missoula. And during that time, two major timber corporations decided to go out of business and in doing so, they liquidated the timber that were their assets around western Montana. We have talked about the the, uh, the problem of the checkerboard on this podcast before, where during the frontier days, the divestiture of, of federal land, uh, the government would give a square mile to the railroad, a square mile to a mining company, a square mile to a timber company, and then keep a square mile for in what are now public lands. Uh, and that was what happened around western Montana when the slogan corporations began to slick off all of the timber with all the um, the consequences that you might imagine with that. And uh, Dick Manning was a reporter then and was covering this, and he was talking with the loggers who were on the ground uh, cutting themselves out of a job, and they didn't like what they were doing, but they needed a job. They knew that they were cutting themselves out of a job, but they needed a job right now. And so in that way, his reporting sort of encapsulated a lot of the uh, environmental and conservation issues of that moment. And that moment then resonates out to, to through our history and into our future. I love the book. And so I followed his work from then on through eight more books that I know of. He spent a lot of time on prairie stuff. One of them was the Grassland, the History of Biology, Politics and Promise of the American Prairie. It's a fantastic book. Rewild in the West, Restoration in a Prairie Landscape. During that time, he got on, he wrote a, he wrote a book called Against the Grain, How Agriculture Has Hijacked Civilization. And this led him into another book where he traveled the world seeking a future for agriculture and environment both. In Against the Grain, a lot of people have probably read on this vein, Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma, or Yuval Harari's Sapiens. Dick Manning was actually writing before those books and and deeply immersed in this subject. So I, I highly recommend Against the Grain. His latest book is Go Wild, Eat Fat, Run Free, Be Social, and Follow Evolution's Other Rules for Total Health and Well-Being. Before we start here, I'd like you to... Uh, Dick Manning has 40 years of research and his opinions are formed from a deep immersion in some of the subjects that are most dear to myself and to those who come to this podcast for for these these type of subjects. So you can agree with Dick Manning's conclusions, his thoughts, his beliefs, whatever, or disagree totally with them. Um, his his understanding is his own, and it's hard won. So I guess I'd say take it or leave it, but it's a very important to listen to a man who has spent four decades immersed in these subjects. And that's one reason I'm so glad to have him here. Um, Thank you very much for being here and joining us. Hunting drew me into the wilderness initially, and that really led to a lot of the lessons. The kind of observation that has to happen when you are a hunter teaches you a whole lot. I just read a quote that I'm going to use a lot as I go forward now. It says, paying attention is another word for prayer. Wow. That's awesome. And that's what you do. <laughs> when you're a hunter, you pay attention. And it's yeah. that humility that comes, that sense of prayerfulness that comes that allows you to absorb the landscape and see things that other people don't see. And and, and that begins with hunting. And that's the value we have in living in a wild landscape in Montana. Yeah. And the lesson that we can take to the rest of the people in the country in some ways say, no, no, this is not about recreation, folks. This is about the way we inhabit the earth. And it's those larger lessons that we as hunters learn that we can bring to the the political discourse and say, no, 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 it's not just about dollars and cents. It's about the value of our lives and the integrity of our lives. I want to thank the Filson Company 
for sponsoring this podcast. We wouldn't be here without them. Since 1897, Filson has outfitted woodsmen, hunters, and anglers with the best clothing and gear. I don't know if anybody remembers the Filson 10 pants, which were a standard logger pant back in the old days um, and ended up being used also by bird hunters and anybody who needed a completely indestructible pair of pants. Filson's archives are full of testimonials to the Mackinac wool, the tin cloth pants helping sportsmen survive in the wild. In support of the Forest Service efforts to protect our public lands, Filson's limited edition collection of Smoky Bear products has just hit their website. And with a full selection of fishing vests and dry bags for rafting, and, and I use a dry bag for everything now, uh, but Filson has you covered. And it goes from the Kenai to the Madison. Come on out and check out Filson.com for any gear you might need. That's Filson, unfailing good since 1897. Thanks again for their sponsorship. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is Hal Herring. This is Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Podcast and Blast. Um, I am. We're doing some Montana-centric stuff these days. Not, not yet hit the road. So uh, I'm lucky to be here. You'll have already heard an introduction uh, that we do for people who've already done it, been very accomplished, and I don't want to waste their time. So I'm here with Dick Manning, um, who is the author of many books, starting with one that I picked up in the 90s called Last Stand, which was uh, kind of an expose he did while working at the Missoulian um, of the kind of disastrous timber practices of that. The late eighties, right, Dick? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. The champion international liquidating their assets. Yeah. Um, and it really, I, it, I wouldn't say it set the stage for the rest of your work. Cause a lot of the rest of the work is, is in a totally different vein, but it's all in that same realm of, of sort of ecology and, and, uh, I wouldn't say disastrous practices cause you have a lot of solutions in all these, this, these books too. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, you're right. It did set the stage for all of my work from there on. It was the, the questions I left unanswered in that book ended up being the ones I answered in subsequent books. Yeah. And you get 10 or eight or eight or 10 good questions and pretty soon you got a list of books. So that's the way it worked right. out for me. Yeah. yeah. So, um, just looking at the ones I brought here is, uh, this is, is rewild in the West. It's not your latest cause you have a book. Uh, tell me something about that book of free your, uh, the, the one you wrote with the physician. Oh yeah, it was called Go Wild. Okay, Go Wild, and it 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 was kind of took all the lessons I learned from ecology and and landscape ecology, especially, and applied them to uh, individual humans. Here are the lessons that nature offers for our bodies and how we ought to live and respect the uh, the evolutionary design of our bodies, and and it was, it was kind of a recipe for rewilding our own bodies. Gotcha. Yeah. And 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 being outside. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and so, eating differently and so forth, and, and right. especially uh, the the problems caused by industrial agriculture in our bodies, but also lack of exercise, uh, lack of being in nature, lack of sleep, all yeah. those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I found that while I was researching this, and I thought Rewild in the West was one of the last, but that that was your latest book, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, it um, was. You've got another one coming out. I do on music, oddly enough, which Great. is a real departure for yeah. me. But that, and it's not so much a departure. But yeah, most of my work has been on um, uh, environmental science. Um, I'm, I'm basically a science writer, and started out that way. But then I kind of slipped the boundaries every now and again. Right on. As as uh, they say, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of a tiny mind. Yeah, and so I you never, don't have to worry about that. I've never <laughs> been able to manage it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> so I um, I came back to your work. Recently, um, a lot of people are listening to this. Will have listened to the Rudy Raceline podcast. He was a visionary guy from the Midwest who's recreating agriculture there, um, methane capture and and prairie restoration. And Rudy handed me Rewild in the West yeah. as I was leaving his place there in Missouri. Yeah, and we both the one of the things we really got together on and and just were amazed. We, our conversations were both against the grain and grassland. Yeah, and um, I, as I told you before this started, um, I took a trip to go to Ulm, Montana, and, and it's on the Missouri River from my house, a back road, and I uh, I I found myself in a landscape which would have been most one of the most beautiful places in the world, which is between Square Butte and Crown Butte, and the road runs straight as an arrow to the Missouri River. I'm sure it's an old old trail, Buffalo Native Americans back to the Ice <laughs> Age, and uh. It is a place that's absolutely devoid of any life. It's Kim fallowed. 
Um, it's wheat and barley. Uh, the communities are gone. The people are gone. The houses are abandoned. Um, there's nothing but this Kim followed landscape. Uh, and I noticed in grassland at one point you said there was that, that some of the prairies have as many as 240 species. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly so. I mean, right here and even in western Montana, which we think is, is not quite that um, species, it is. I mean, you can go out in a, a Mount Jumbo here near Missoula and you can find areas with 200 species on quite easily. Yeah. That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, I mean the... The fundamentalism involved in that converting a landscape to, to its ultimate simplicity, um, it just blows my mind, you know? Yeah. And, I, and I don't think it's working for the farmers either. No. If you look at commodity prices and, and subsidies and how much money people are making and, and keeping, um, so... Yeah, yeah, and I thought about, a lot about that in writing, and it was interesting you brought up the Midwest because I took a lot of what I learned in wild land and, and wilderness in Montana and took to places like Iowa. Mm-hmm. Iowa has something like 1% of its native landscape left. Yeah. But those lessons are applicable there. There are things they ought to think about. And then the result of that monoculture of actually stripping the landscape is, first of all, they, they literally stripped it. The, the topsoil's gone. They had 10 feet of topsoil in some places there. Well, yeah. that was all carbon. So yeah. that's all now in the atmosphere. Right. But beyond that, I mean, it's made that landscape incredibly brittle. That it just has, it can't roll with the punches any longer. And that's what nature allows us to do with that diversity is to roll with the punches. And Lord knows we're taking punches these days. Yeah. And we kind of wish we had that resiliency. Right. And resiliency comes <clears throat> up a lot. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, as it should. Yeah. I was, I spent some time in South Florida doing some, a story on the Everglades, you know, and the brittleness of that now, it's amazing. Yeah, it's you know, um, it's we have choked it to the point where it's barely, it's it's just holding on. Yeah, and in the face of the buffeting of climate change and storms and and more people and more needs. Yeah, um, it's breaking. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I'm old enough to remember stationary motors that we had to run things like buzz saws and stuff like that when I was a kid on a farm, and they had governors on them, and we'd wire the governors open and tie them open to run full steam so yeah. we could cut wood faster. Well, the engine would blow up in almost no time. Right. What we've done is wire the governors open on our entire landscape, and it has no ability to recover now. Right. Gotcha. Well, one of the things, so, and, and for people listening to this, too, I think I, I would like to, I, I, I would remind you that you had, in the book Grassland, at the very end, um, is it against the grain or grassland where you you talk about your hunting at the end? Yeah, I, I think I talk about hunting in both of those because yeah. it's really important to me. And you came from that. You came from your ecological sense came from an immersion in landscape that I could I recognize as a hunter's immersion immediately reading these books. Yeah, 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 I was raised that way, so I never do do any differently. Um, I grew up in northern Michigan, which is still relatively wild for in terms of Midwest. We still had. Um, a landscape where that we could do things like go hunting and wander yeah. around. And I, and as a kid, that's what I did. And so I uh, got kind of hooked on it and uh, hunting drew me into the wilderness initially. And, and, and that really led to a lot of the lessons, the kind of observation that has to happen when you are a hunter teaches you a whole lot. Um, I, j- I just read a quote that I'm going to uh, use a lot as I go forward. Now it says, um, Paying attention is another word for prayer. Wow, that's and, awesome. And that's what you do. <laughs> when you're a hunter, you pay attention. And, yeah. and it's that, that humility that comes, that sense of prayerfulness that comes that allows you to absorb the landscape and see things that other people don't see. Yeah. And, and, and that begins with hunting. Wow, yeah, that's a great quote. Yeah. Where did, you, uh, where did you encounter this? An Italian writer who was actually quoting Robert Frost. <laughs> wow. So nice. It goes around and it comes around. Yeah. Well, I, um, you, had, you have a piece in there about um, hunting pronghorn where, um, and this, this, I did not, I still hunt pronghorn and love it, but um, I, I experienced the same thing you did where you, you saw these incredible animals, survivors from the Ice Age, and, that, and, and hunting them was, was really one of the most interesting experiences you can have on the prairie yeah um and then you see kind of the way people treat them with running them with trucks and yeah. and cornering them with atvs and stuff and uh and and it, it, it killed it for you 
Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. hunting more and more has become that way. I mean, especially uh, there's a class of hunters that insist on uh, being surrounded by elk all the time so they can shoot them out the window of their pickup truck. Right. Well, that's not what it's about. If they want to do that, they could have livestock. They can just go sure. to a feedlock and get beef. I mean, yeah. that's, it's a different deal when you... Uh, I, I enjoy the days when I come home empty-handed yeah. because well, I've learned a lot. you paid attention. That's right. Yeah. I paid attention that day. And to me, that's what it's about. What it's about getting out there and seeing the animals and, and 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 i still value the meat and what i bring home from there but yeah but i want i want to know something about those animals and i don't think you do that off an atv or the back of the pickup truck right certainly less yeah yeah absolutely yeah. i remember being at the derby check station one year and uh uh this guy said um we drove two tanks of gas on the Johnson Tire Road. It's, it, you know where Johnson Creek is down there? Yeah, it goes. I do. You can get to the bitter, the, yeah. the big hole that way. Yeah. He said, we did two tanks of gas, and we didn't see a damn thing. Yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> With that diesel engine. <laughs> yeah. I just remember that. It was, yeah. I was probably in my 20s, yeah. and I was thinking, wow, what a, I, I had never really thought of hunting that way, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I still don't think of that, and I'm but an old the, guy. Yeah, but at the time, it was... um. <laughs> Uh, there was, a, I guess, there was a lot of elk in there, and people killed them that way. You know, yeah. you're kind of cheating yourself out of out of the the prayer. Yeah, yeah, you really are. Yeah, yeah. Spend the time out there. Yeah, yeah. and I one of the things that was uh, you had, you gave me out of this, you you had that quote, um, but the word was gracile or gracile. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've never gracile. heard that before. Yeah, yeah, really graceful animals, and it's, it's, it's another word for the same thing. Yeah, and, and that was what, what's interesting about that the, was the pronghorn. The, yeah, what, what's interesting about pronghorn is is uh, scientists believe they're the really the 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 only animal, the only large mammal we have that survived the Pleistocene extinction. Yeah, and in other words, they weren't hunted to death, and all our other native animals in North America, like woolly mammoths, things like that, were hunted to death. But these yeah. guys were smart enough and wily enough they could stay the away fast. from the hunters. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. You got to respect that in the end. You just yeah. respect that. And yeah. That's just a cool thing. Well, we get, I'm lucky to watch them all the time and they're, they've come back winter of 2011. I don't think it killed them, but they left. Yeah. And, and we just now have the same numbers like around where I live as we yeah. had before 2011. Yeah. And, um, they are such a, they're just one of my favorite animals to watch. Yeah. I love to hunt them, yeah. but just on a day to day basis, yeah. they're just really strange. They echo, they echo from another dimension. Yeah. And and I and I know that uh you correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't weren't they pursued by an American cheetah in the in the place of scene? Yeah, no doubt, yeah. yeah. There, there were animals like that. There were some really incredible predators in that period that were just really unable to catch them. So that's what made them what they are in a lot of ways. Yeah. But I, I after I did grassland, I got the flip side of that story because uh, grassland was really about resurrection and what we could do in the American prairie to bring it back. And, and subsequent to that, the whole Bakken oil field development started in North Dakota. So I did a story on that as well. And, and the take home from that story story for me was the fact that North Dakota had this marvelous pronghorn herd and, and they hunted them and they were at home in that grassland there until the Bakken came along. Mm -hmm. And the Bakken development had about three years in when I started doing that story, they had zero pronghorns left in North Dakota like that. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, that hopefulness that I had in grassland went away with the kind of large scale development that goes on with things like the Bakken oil field. Right. I've, I've both flown the Bakken and I also did a trip on the Missouri River once where we pulled out at Williston. Yeah. And that was after it crashed. That was yeah. after the, the the whole thing had, had stopped yeah, yeah. pretty much for a while. This is five years ago, I guess. Like it is now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think uh I have a question for you. And do you think that the Bakken had it been a well regulated uh phase development? could have been a blessing rather than all climate change stuff aside yeah could have been a blessing rather than what we saw no no no, no way uh, that, because of the and everybody worries about uh, fracking and the chemistry that goes on with fracking but I worry about the intensity that goes on and, and it's really labor intensive it's and and it involves a whole lot of people going to a site and doing a whole lot of work and 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 every drill site is evenly spaced and so it looks like a checkerboard from a For farm spider web is what we've, yeah. we thought of it in the sky and that intensity of development that goes on with that um it precludes any sort of of nature around yeah. it and it, it's 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 now it might as well be farmed yeah 
and and so we lost that grassland. Gotcha. To them, they also they had they've had a, the farming has been impacted by the brine spills. Yeah. Um. I mean, I it's yeah. it's kind of a one a single you know Pinedale anticline outside of Pinedale, Wyoming. Yeah. They had eleven thousand vehicle trips up under that thing in December of two thousand and four yeah. once, and then they took the counter down. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's the kind of thing you're talking about. That's exactly yeah. the problem. It's that industrial scale development that yeah. occurs out there. And, yeah. and, and, and that's unique to fracking. So that's what worries me. Gotcha. Well, um, so one of the things that before we move on from hunting um, is uh, it, it definitely seems to me that I, I spent a lot of time reading your stuff. I had already been reading it, but I was going back to it. And it, it is definitely hunting is, is, a, is a, inside it. But it's it's the best. I'm not going to flatter you too much, but it's the best kind of reporting because it's by somebody who's paying attention, who's brought in the consciousness of a person who pays attention in, as a hunter yeah. to the to microcosmic things on the landscape. Yeah, and that's grassland. That 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 attention to. I mean, this these are. I've thought about this. The grasslands themselves is probably the most endangered ecosystem on the planet. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. It's yeah. true. Yeah. Because of agriculture. That's yeah. where agriculture lives. It yeah. lives in grassland. And yeah. um, have you been to the tall grass down in? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And tall grass restoration projects that have gone on and so forth. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the ecosystem we lost. But, you know, what, what really allows me to, I, no, I'm lucky. And what allows me to do that and, and, and bring the larger issues to bear on these small, what seemingly small questions, that kind of reporting is living in Montana. Mm -hmm. and, and it is because you mentioned I worked at the Missoulian, and, and by happenstance, they made me an environmental reporter. So I spent a lot of time with biologists out in the field looking at wilderness, how it works, being absolutely awestruck by that. And as soon as you begin to understand that and pay attention to it, then you see things in the rest of the world that other people do not see, right. that they don't have the ability to see it because they've never seen nature in, in its entirety functioning in one right. big piece. And that's the value we have in living in a wild landscape in Montana. Yeah. And, 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 and the lesson that we can take to the rest of the people in the country in some ways saying, no, no, this is, this is, this is not about recreation, folks. This is about the way we inhabit the earth. Gotcha. You yeah. know, and, <laughs> that's a that's a tall one right now because what how do you, how do you see um how do you see us emerging into that kind of consciousness yeah we have an enormous opportunity right now and 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 and, and i'm thinking about that a lot these days with things like the pandemic that's on us and, and worries about global warming and the political crisis is on the country and and if you think about the, the the kind of clash, the political clash that's going on. It's about it's about everything public. Mm -hmm. In other words, we have privatized everything. We have traded it. We've created everything into this simple, brittle economy, and everything has to have a value in dollars and cents, or nobody will talk about it on the political landscape. And what I, what I want to say is, no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. It's first of all about that brittle landscape, but it's also this thing we have in common this public resource, be it public education or public lands, those things are what make us uh, resilient as people. Right. And we need to value that. I mean, we can go back to Teddy Roosevelt, for instance, and he talked about the, the American spirit being built on the landscape, being built in wilderness, and that's real. Yep. That's real, and that's what we're losing. We're losing that ability to cooperate, get along with each other, take care of the landscape, and have some respect for the 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 natural forces that rule our lives. One of the great quotes in that was he said, um, it, it, unless it works for all of us on some level, it won't work for any of us. Yeah. And yeah. that is not, I mean, he was a rugged individualist. He's like running up San Juan Hill. He's recruiting, what, 30,000 people to go yeah. to Cuba. Yeah. I mean, but this is a person who also understood ecology, uh, both on the landscape and in human ecology. Yeah, you know, yeah. I just learned that there's actually a uh, you can get a degree in human ecology at, yeah. Cor at Cornell. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you should be able to. Yeah, and but if you you think about it, hunting gives gives us a really good example of what's wrong. And, and as hunters, we can understand this right away because if economists look at hunting, they'd say, well, you've only got a mere hundred pounds of calories and carbohydrates out of that animal, and you 
spend X number of dollars getting it, and that's the value of hunting. Right. Well, it's not the value of hunting. Right. It's not why we're out there. We're out there for that, but we're out for, for many more things. Yeah. And, and somebody, any waterfowler could tell you that, huh? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And and so that, somebody once said that an economist is somebody who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. nothing. Yeah, for and, sure. and that's what we're all about in this country, that we have gotten everything so quantified to economy and the immediate profit motive. How do we make money out of this today? How do we take a landscape and turn a buck on it as opposed to how do we survive on it? And it's those larger lessons that we as hunters learn that we can bring to the other, the rest of the, 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 the political right. discourse and say, no, 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 it's not just about dollars and cents. It's about the value of our lives and the right. integrity of our lives. And that has to do with the integrity of the landscape. Well, and you know, one of your quotes on that, which I wrote here, um, you're, you're, and by, by, as to people who would, will read these books, and I hope they will, um, there's a lot. You you are a person who also specializes in solutions, yeah. um, which is a very different kind of brand of, of riding for riding a different brand yeah. completely, you know, yeah. um, whereas so many of us do the litany of disaster, you know, yeah. oh, it spills in the Arctic. I was seeing, watching that yesterday, you know, and in the Russian Arctic, the, the oil spills and all. But if you, if you take on a Dick Manning book like this, you're going to be offered some some solutions it's there's a, there's a huge amount of hope in your work yeah yeah um, I, I think less so now than there used to be yeah um because of the, you know, for, for instance i do use that example of the bakken and i didn't think we would go that far but we have right we have or we haven't you know, when i wrote about um the agriculture in the midwest uh, the the corn economy was the real problem with that. We now put 40% of that corn into our gas tanks as ethanol. Right. And I never thought that would happen in a million years. So right. we are really backed up against now. We have become more brittle than when I was writing. But at the same time, there are people who now think in terms of solutions, and there's a, there's a major solution available in our public lands. And there's a global movement afoot started by some conservation biologists, but um, it, it's most applicable in the United States of saying 30% of the surface area of the earth needs to be protected in protected status by 2030, mm -hmm. 30 by 30. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, we could do that quite easily because about 30% of our land is public to right. begin with. And so we begin viewing that not as something to exploit for oil and gas or timber or minerals, we view that as a reserve where we can sequester carbon. We can do things like do flood control. We can treat it like an ark where we are preserving animals against the rain, the hard rain that's going to fall here yeah. and extinction. And by doing, building in that resilience, we will first of all address global warming, but also ensure some sort of future for the, for the, for the planet yeah. in some way. And we can do that. That yeah. can be done. So, yeah, I'm hopeful in some ways. What do you uh, – this is, this is not something I plan to talk to you about, so I, I'm breaking new, new ground without yeah. any concepts. But what do you think required – what do you, do you think would require to build the political energy to, to do something like that? Yeah, uh, I think part of it will be negative. In other words, we understand that we are in serious trouble. And the, uh, it's not dawned on everybody that that's true yet, but we are. We are in an extinction crisis. That is happening, but it, it will include human extinction at some point. And that we have made our landscape so brittle that things like flooding in the Midwest has oh, it's become incredible. devastating. Yeah. So part of what we need to do is restore wetlands right. on public lands to absorb that water. And we right. say we can do ecosystem services will pay for the problems um, but the, the solutions in ways that we hadn't imagined. And give you a good example. I was doing a story in the city of Milwaukee, well, maybe 10 years ago. And the Midwest right now is inundated with uh, floods. They have the rain, the global warming has made rainfall so severe that everything is flooded. And the city of Milwaukee has many abandoned houses. Something like 10% of their houses were abandoned because of the economic crisis there. So instead of building a storm sewer system that would cost them millions and millions of dollars. They bought those houses, tore them down, and created drainage paths through the city. 
and planted them in the grass. Restored gotcha. yep. grassland that controlled the floods. Yeah. So ecosystem services can pull us out here. Yeah. That's a small example, but we can do that at landscape level and understand that the things that we're paying for in disaster relief, that sort of thing that's going on, the nature will do for us for free if we just let it do its yeah. work. Yeah, I would say reform a federal flood insurance program would be you got to do that, right? Oh, instantly, yeah. yeah. Place, I mean, there are examples of houses in Houston, for instance, that we paid for like three times in right. flood insurance, and they just build it again and flood them again. Well, no, that's not going to work. Right. And you got to learn to roll with the punches, and right. that's what the landscape is teaching us. And, I mean, it, I think Taxpayers for Common Sense actually came up with one of those. Yeah. And they yeah. were they were just like, we're, we're, we're dying here. Yeah. The, 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 the program is out of money at the end of July. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I remember the Corps of Engineers uh, ran out of money dredging Southwest Pass in Louisiana by July yeah. one year. Yeah. And they're like going, why are you continuing to do this money, like fire hose of money into nothingness? Yeah. 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 Th- yeah. And that's what we need to understand, that we need to back off. But we can't keep this brittle landscape because, you know, I... Uh, People talk about global warming in terms of denial, you know, like the whole right wing in the, in the country is in denial over global warming. Well, yeah, that's true enough. But, you know, we forget that Elizabeth Kubler Ross, who had the stages of grief, sure. she talked about denial. That's where we got that. But there's also bargaining in there. And that's what we do. We bargain. We say, well, if I put us some solar cells, you know, and a windmill over here, everything's yep. going to be just good and we can go on living the way we're going to live. Yeah. No, you can't. No, it's honest. They, you you can't bargain with us either. That this is like death. Mm-hmm. It's very much like death. And what we need we need to understand that we have to respect nature's limits. And that's ultimately what the wilderness teaches us: respect nature's limits. Travel light, go light on the landscape. Learn to live more simply, and maybe some of us can survive into a future. Yeah. And do you see it? Um, like, okay, so again, political will. So what what would it take? Do you think that there is a critical mass of American citizen voters who could be convinced that this was a priority? Not at the moment. No, certainly not, because we're swimming upstream against a, a, a very heady current, heavy current of propaganda. Yeah. And, and that has convinced a lot of people, especially because most Americans are urban and they don't see these issues the way we see them living you know, in Montana with fire season and wilderness right. and all that stuff that goes on. So, no. But uh, my answer to that is, okay, maybe they don't see it today, but they will. Right. It's just going to get worse. So how much punishment can you take until you start to say, wait a minute, maybe we should do something? Uh, how do you look at your kids and understand what their lives are going to be like 20 years from now and not do something? Right. And, okay, maybe not this year, but next year or the year after? I was just tracking those payments on the flooded ground that couldn't be planted last year. Actually, it started in 2011. It couldn't be planted last year. So um, I would... I, Way I'm, I've been talking with people who don't agree with me about climate change or about anything, yeah. which is fine. Yeah, I don't like it when everybody's agreeing. Yeah, I think that, that that's a one way ticket to doing something stupid. So I would I'd, I'd say, well, like, what are you? Obviously, the people are saying that this ain't happening are taking the farm subsidy payment or the crop insurance payment. So you can't really just do that forever. Yeah, you say, well, this is not a problem. But I need to file this insurance claim every year. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's that Rube Goldberg machine, yeah. and I, I right. keep coming back the to Rube, Rube Goldberg. Goldberg. That's actually, what we yeah. are. Yeah. We're, 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 tell, yeah. tell me what that is. Yeah, well, he, he was a guy who designed these very fancy machines to do simple jobs. Right. But there's a, 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 a better example. Or you know, the guy keeps patching his flat roof. <laughs> you know. Right. Stop patching the damn roof and put a pitch on it, and right. you'll be fine. And that's gotcha. where we are. We keep putting yeah. patches on problems and a patch on the patch on the patch on the patch instead yeah. of fixing it. And that's what that is. Gotcha. I would also refer people to your book, uh, A Good House. Yeah. Which is like like that. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's an ecological, like, uh, that's a really cool uh, chronicle yeah. of trying to build something that works. Yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, what I'm doing here is uh, there's a resonance through your, your work. And it, it's it's completely there. Like it, it's it's fascinating to me as yeah. a as a person who's reading this. You know, 
Well, um, some, guys, some guys can only think of one idea, and that's the me. You know, well, that's so. it. And, and then you carry and <laughs> yeah. you carry it to the to the four corners of the globe. You figure out a way to yeah. make a living on that one idea, and yeah. then you're all set. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about your venture into high fidelity music. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Um, so one of the things uh, in, in this, we go back to another thing. I had just read Doug Peacock's "In the Shadow of the Saber Tooth" on the Pleistocene, yeah. um, and. Uh, you you really you were talking about that a long time ago too, but pre horse culture. Yeah. And so, do you feel that things worked? Obviously, there was a great extinction at that yeah. point. Yeah. With stone technology and and ground sloths. Yeah, exactly. So, and and since then, there but there's been a lot of science on that issue and, and disagreeing with the extinction hypothesis. So the jury's still out on that in some way. But we certainly know there were extinctions before industrialism came along. Yeah, and it could have been as simple as what we're experiencing right now: pandemics, right, and diseases. Right. So that that, that that as humans or other animals moved across the land bridge into North America, they brought some problem with them that caused things to go extinct. We know that happened. We just don't know exactly gotcha. what it was. Yeah. But yeah, and then they had some fairly powerful technologies. They did. They had hunting. The piskin too. And they the, had... The jump. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they had fire. And, yeah. and fire was a big deal. Yeah. I mean, and it, it, it certainly molded this landscape in, in the West where we live in, in, in significant ways. So, right. yeah. But n- they had nothing like the plow. And, right. And the plow is really what, what is it, re- remade the, the earth. Gotcha. Now, in, um, I, there's a great uh, quote from your book in there, and we'll, we'll get on this in a minute, but the conflict between freedom and the plow. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, we were, we were talking about Yuval Harari's book, Sapiens, before we started this recording. Yeah. And um, and Yuval Harari brought some of that from, from Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan brought some of that from your work. Yeah. Um, it's this, there's this idea, and, and you speak to this if you would. There wasn't a time, of, an idyllic time of, of Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve all happen, happily living on this pre-agricultural world. But there was a pre-agricultural world of humanity. Absolutely, and, and it's most of humanity. Yes. So it was, humanity is probably 50,000, 55,000 years old. And, yep. we, and we can, there's a fine line that really says these are humans um, and a bunch of things came together at point about 50,000 years ago only about 5,000 of that and if you want to be liberal about it 10,000 has been under agriculture mm-hmm. the rest of it are, are 40,000 50,000 years of our human evolution has been as hunters and gatherers without agriculture those were the terms of our evolution those that you know it's just like any species we evolved in an ecosystem and that made us who we are and we were made who we are by being hunters yeah. in, 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 in significant ways and in being wild animals like, yeah. like those hunters. And we were domesticated by agriculture about 8,000 years ago. And we think we domesticated plants well, and you can make every bit as good argument that plants domesticated yeah. us. And I think when I look at humans today and human behavior and the problems with human behavior have, I just want to put one label on it, which is domestication. We have been tamed. We have been tamed as much as livestock in a stall. Yeah. We eat the same food as livestock in a stall now. We say yes, sir, and no, sir, to our masters, like livestock in a stall. And we have lost our humanity as a result. Well. And I would go one further. This is not me. You're, this is everybody's work, yours included, which is earlier. Um, that also gave rise to the huge armies. Like, yeah, like, absolutely. Like this is like like institutionalized violence. Yeah, is also a product of agriculture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You really couldn't raise an army before because you didn't have the food for them. You couldn't travel right. and without grain. And right. Once you had grain, then you could store food and they could travel like that. And yeah, we had skirmishes before. Right. People mixed it up, but nothing like we see in the streets of Washington D.C. this week. Right. And I don't. Uh, I I can't remember this exact quote, and I don't want to mess it up. But uh, in if you read the biography of Crazy Horse by Mari Sandoz, um, American Horse pointed out to them that he, I don't know if he was literate or whether somebody, he, he was very interested in, in what was happening in, in the East. Yeah. And he read, he either read about or was told about Gettysburg. And he said, you know, a battle for us is four or five people killed 
That's right. And, a, and, and we consider that a massive success, yeah. you know, and we lose four or five. Yeah. And, and there's lamentation in the villages. Yeah. And he said, these people have just slain like 20,000 people. Yeah. And they, they just getting started. Yeah. Yeah. And industrialized killing. We yeah. can, we can do that too. Um, because you can carry the food. Right. Right. I mean, I, I just, I've always thought that was fascinating that because you, you consider a pastoralist or agricultural life as more peaceful, but actually it's, it's not. No, no, uh, it's violence. <laughs> it's violence from the very beginning. It's violence on the landscape. Mm-hmm. It's taking all of nature and reducing it to a single species. Mm-hmm. That's what it's about. Can we, we, can we take this landscape of 200 species of plants and make it grow wheat? Mm-hmm. And, and your war is on every other single species that might right. inhabit that place, animal or plant. Gotcha. Is there a, is there a way out of that one? Yeah, there is, but it's it's about a reinvention of agriculture. Well, the, the, the time honored way is, hunt, <laughs> is, is hunting. Yeah, you, sure. you know, you can go get your food in a landscape that is completely diverse, biodiverse. And right. you know, when you shoot an elk, you leave a bunch of elk on the landscape. But right. You leave all the plants and everything else. And, and is, we probably had as many cattle and elk and so forth on the landscape pre-settlement as we have cattle now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I was amazed at those figures of the feral, like when the cattle yeah. found their way into Argentina, people dropped them off, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they just exploded, they exploded in the yeah. niche. Yeah. 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 yeah, and horses as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And in North America as well. Yeah. So the landscape will produce food without us uh, beating it into submission. But agriculture it allows control of people. It's back to that idea of domestication. Gotcha. That it, you know, one of the things that happened... They can say, well, agriculture began in this city 5,000 years ago. One of the ways they know that is by big houses. Uh If you go to a a pre-agricultural settlement, all the huts are the same size. But you go to an early agricultural community 5,000 years ago, and there's one very big house with granaries next to it and then a bunch of huts around it. Gotcha. It's for front of very beginning. Yeah. From the very beginning. And, And then there's actually a ratio that they've calculated that says, no, this is how many privileged people will live in any agricultural society and that ratio holds up to this day well that's amazing yeah 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 i was um i'm reading and it's it's reductionist but uh i'm reading heather cox richardson's book how the south won the civil war oh yeah and um it's reductionist and i i don't agree with a lot of it but i love her i love her work and um she talks about the slave economy Mm -hmm. and it was export agriculture and cotton and and uh they were repeating this thing that had happened in England where the wool became the big thing and then the lanolin and, and the mills. And then so they pushed, they took the serfs who had previously been producing food and just told them to get lost, that we, we have to maximize yeah. the sheep. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that was part of the, the unrest that started yeah. that, that. I mean, it was a terrific ter- period of unrest because of the landless people yes. afloat on that landscape. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and that sort of upheaval has been the rule of history for ten thousand years. Mm-hmm. You can have example after example after example of that sort of thing when people were no longer required for that particular economy. So we'll we'll let them go. Right. Just like the American Midwest right now, we're going to close those factories. What do we do with those people? We don't care. Right. You know, so Wendell Berry wrote a great essay a long time ago called "What Are People For?" Yep, I remember that. And, and that was the whole idea. It says, "Wait a minute, if we, we're." constantly making people superfluous we don't need these people anymore and we and we just send them away to go starve or whatever then what are people for and 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 so isn't the economy supposed to serve people as opposed to vice versa but if we look at today where we are today or where we've been through most of history no no the the idea is that we are here to serve the economy that doesn't make sense again in the stall yeah hey everybody this is hal herring Backcountry Hunters and Anglers podcast and blast. Hey, uh, if you are not already a member of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, uh, this is a great chance to sign up, join up, and uh, be part of something powerful, standing together and having a good time, celebrating America's public lands and working to protect our future hunt and fishing there. Please go to uh, backcountryhunters.org forward slash BHA podcast. And you'll see there, there's a, you get a $25 value t-shirt. The whole thing's 35 bucks. So you get a shirt, 
And for 10 bucks, you're part of the, one of the most powerful conservation movements in the United States. Uh, that comes with Backcountry Journal, which is a really great magazine, and it comes with part of being a movement that we're going to need more than ever in this future that's coming up in the wake of this pandemic and all of this government spending with these deficits. People are going to be, they're, they're going to be cutting funding for public lands. They're going to be going after public lands. We're going to need to stand tall and stand united, and this is the best way to do it right now. Pick up a membership to Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. And uh, we'll see you out there, man. For this, for, for this audience of people who hunt and fish, and or, so, I mean, there's a huge movement in the United States, and you talk about it a little bit on the on the diversification of agriculture, um, which reminds me before I forget, you were with the Tarahumara in northern Mexico. One of my favorite pieces in this, where the guy's going to market, and he's got like 50 different products. Yeah. From a very small holding. Yeah, 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 and that's commonplace. I mean, yeah. and that's the way. But that's the way even agriculture was when, you know, a generation ago. Yeah, any farmer, right, sure. farmers would try to to uh, um, uh, replicate what was going on in nature with diversity. You have a few hogs, few chickens, a few cows. And they'd have like 10 different crops growing, and then they'd use a manure to their fertilizer. Right. That was agriculture when I was a kid. Yep. Not that long ago. Well, now yep. it's not. It's in, it's completely industrialized. Right. It's all about chemicals. You spread enough chemicals down, you grow one crop of corn, then a crop of soybeans, soybeans, and you do the same thing. And all the animals are kept in a in a factory someplace. Right. And that, that fertilizer is coming from natural gas, isn't that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All, yeah. Almost all the fertilizer we use is natural gas. And everybody worries about carbon dioxide, but if you start tracking nitrogen on the planet and nitrogen flows from fertilizer, you have a lot more to worry about, yeah. as a matter of fact. As we've seen in Louisiana with the dead zone. and Yeah. 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 yeah and exactly. the Des Moines Water District, yeah. good Lord, do you follow that lawsuit? Yeah, or, or here, in, here in Missoula <laughs> with the nitrogen running off lawns and golf courses into Rattlesnake Creek. Right. You know, this, so we've polluted a creek the second it comes out of wilderness because we want to have a nice green lawn. Right. It's not a good idea, folks. <laughs> right. <laughs> no long, no long term strategy there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, well, there's Wes Jackson's wonderful phrase, and Wes Jackson is the guy who's trying to reinvent agriculture in a lot of ways, and he says that the, the, the natural landscape or the prairie sponsors its own fertility, and that's what it's about. We're, we're about, no, no, nature will fertilize itself. We don't have to do it with chemistry. That's how we make a profit, but it's not how we make food. Gotcha. Can you tell me something about Wes Jackson? That's oh, new yeah. to me. He's a real character, and we were, uh, Wes was the... Uh, He's kind of the flip side of, of, of those of us who think about wilderness and hunting in some ways. And he says, yeah, I'm taking my lessons from nature, but I'm trying to reinvent agriculture in a way that mimics nature as opposed to a monoculture. Okay. So he's, try, he's tried for his whole career now. Where is and he? And he's, he's in Salina, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to reinvent a farm field that looks like a prairie. Mm -hmm. And so it has grasses in it, it has yellow composite flowers in it, it has uh, nitrogen fixers like uh, vetch or something like that. Uh, we have here lupin, for yeah. instance. It's a nitrogen fixer. By growing those plants in what he calls a polyculture, they do exactly what he says. They sponsor their own fertility. So he's doing, and he doesn't plow it up and plant it every year. It grows year after year on this one plot, and then you take a certain amount of grain off it. Gotcha. And that's his. his so it, 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 it saves a lot of energy. It saves uh, the, the the destruction of the landscape, the plowing that goes on, and so forth. And the flood. Yeah. I mean, I just yeah. I, that's been a big thing. Well, well, my house has been flooded, and this is not necessarily because of anybody's actions. Yeah. But we just have a the creek. We're we're in a very if it's climate change or we're in a very rainy. Yeah. Epoch compared yeah. to when I bought that house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And let me tell you, it's a terrifying thing oh. to see. Uh, it, you'll never feel the same about listening to rain on the roof again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and you can imagine what it's like in the Midwest. Then, I can't imagine. Yeah. The entire states have been flooded now for year after year. And it gets year. worse and worse. I yeah. mean, I mean it's, it's just like, yeah. 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 Um, I, I lived in New Orleans for two years before oh. Katrina. Yeah. And um, it was obvious, you know, there that that, that well, I, I'm, I've been living on that prairie for so long, you know. I definitely have a different concept of time. Yeah. We were talking about Malcolm Brooks's book earlier, his novel, Painted Horses. Yeah. It's a very much a book about deep time and Bighorn Canyon and pictographs of Ice Age animals. And these. It's a, it's a wonderful novel, and I'm hoping to meet him soon. 
for this podcast. But uh, I, I still, I can, there's a ground sloth that's butchered up in Blacktail Cave east of my house. Um, and there's a, there's a concept, like, like I was in New Orleans as a young, really young person in college. And I just watched, I was standing on the balcony up, up, way upstairs, and that place is one inch away from going back to one of the most interesting small plans the world has oh, probably yeah. ever seen, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> those beautiful yeah. old buildings, yeah. but it is inundated now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, much, and that's, that's global warming. Yeah. Yeah. And subsidence. I mean, yeah. it's just sinking. Yeah. It's just, I'm, um, and, I, and I, so I, I actually take heart from that. Do yeah, you? so do I. So yeah, do I. yeah, because it's, it's, it's you used to say years ago, nature bats last. Well, yeah. okay, nature's up to bat right now, and we're, right. we're about to be humbled. And how do you adapt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to either roll with the punch, or you're going to die. Yeah, it's that simple, and and the punches will be extreme. Yeah. yeah. So again, um, this is an uncomfortable question, but like, where does the political will come from? Does it come from people who are observing nature and saying that we can fix this if we take a different way. Yeah. How does, where, how do you build that? You've been at this forever. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, and it's worse now than it was when I started in a lot of ways. So one of the complicating issues in this is, is the undermining of our public education system. And we talked about the, the, the war on anything public. Well, public education was the first thing to go. And the fact that we have a less educated electorate than we had 30 years ago is a real problem. Right. How do we do that? And, and so uh, we, we're not going to do this the easy way. The easy right. way might have been to say, look at the science and say, okay, we probably should take some precautions here. That was the easy way. Well, those, those options are now gone. They're off the table. But what's going to happen is going to be far more severe. A lot more people are going to die. And maybe that will cause us to listen to what's going on around us. Right. If not, then nature just keeps applying more and more and more pressure. Right. Do we say uncle? And that's, that's not simple. anything new. I mean, no. any, any erupt, remember the word eruption? Yeah. You know, any yeah. eruption ends in, in decline and crash. Yeah. It doesn't mean extinction though. No, it just means it just means less than well, you had. Actually, it means a lot of extinction, but just not necessarily for humans. Right, right? we're in an right. age of dis- extinction right now, and right. extinction is all around us. It's enormous. Is there, as E.O. Wilson calls it, the Eremocene? Yeah, the That's age of loneliness. Are. Yeah, yeah. there we are. We're we're here, yeah. and so yeah, watch what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And and from all these decades of doing this, uh, our our way our, our way forward. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I really yeah. don't because the stakes are so huge now. I mean, we could talk about this thirty years ago. Now everything is enormous. We've just seen an, an example of it with the pandemic of right. our, our brittleness, right. and no one. It, no one could have predicted the outcomes that we're having at this moment in this country or around the world. Right. Do you, don't you think that this pandemic, though, is, is an argument for what you wrote about? Absolutely. With the absolute diversification of local food source? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It just the, the single one of the facts they've learned about the coronavirus is it preys on people who suffer from diabetes or obesity. That's a direct result of the way we grow food. Mm-hmm. That we grow food and we feed the poorest people on the planet the trashiest food, carbohydrates, essentially sugars. Right. And they corn are syrup. corn syrup. They yeah. are, and they're obese and they're a diabetic and they're dying as a result of this because our own bodies are losing the resilience I was talking about. Gotcha. So those kinds of things ought to be telling us in, in screaming terms that we're in trouble. Right. And that's what the pandemic's point. That's what the flooding points out. It finds all the people living in the lowlands close to the river and right. it says, you're in trouble there. Right. It finds most of the poor population of the world lives in coastal areas that are being flooded. It says, no, you're in trouble there. You shouldn't be inhabiting those places. We're going to continue to get those messages and they're going to get less and less subtle as we go. Yeah. And, and do you think that, uh, and again, and I, I, I tend to be uh, America centric or whatever, you know, because I feel like this is the place that I know yeah. that I could I could actually have some kind of impact. I can't really do anything in Bangladesh, you know, or even and I love Mexico. Yeah. But even in Mexico, I, I gave up. I did some reporting down there, and I love Mexico. Yeah. But um, I've kind of said that's y'all's purview there. There's really really intelligent, great writers in Mexico, yeah. and I'm I'm pulling back to my own home country here, you yeah. know. Yeah. And it does seem that we are a temperate country. 
<laughs> we're a relatively prosperous country. Mm. We could make we could be the people who who solve these problems. Yeah, yeah. we're not yet completely overcrowded. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. No, we can do a lot. Actually, uh, I'm taking my example from Europeans these days, so because they are doing a lot at the mm-hmm. moment, and. Uh, this, this, so one of the things we have to do is remake our economy. And you say, well, that sounds kind of pie in the sky. And, 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 um, but it turns out they're actually doing it in Europe. And so one of the things we have to eliminate is economic growth. We cannot have permanent growth. I mean, it's Ed Abbey who said that yep. uh, permanent growth is the ideology of a cancer cell. And that's exactly right. Only economists think that's a good idea, that we can right. keep growing forever and, 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 and get by. Well, how do we do that? Well, what the, they're talking about now, and there's something called a degrowth movement that talks in terms of prosperity. In other words, we're not going to make you rich. We're going to make you prosperous. We're going to make your life more fulfilling. You're going to spend more time outside. You're going to spend more time with your family. You're going to spend less time working. You're going to make less money. Those things. And because you don't need as much money, we can get by with less. We can certainly get by without billionaires. We can do that pretty quickly. So that sort of thing in it almost immediately leads to also a decline in population. People stop having as many kids. And that's the other thing that we've stopped talking about. We need to talk about. There are too many humans on this planet. And so those agreed. (laughs) So if we can back down the economy and that's what we deal with, how we deal with global warming, not with solar cells, we have to, we have to decrease the economy. We have to stop running our engine with the governors wide open and simply say, no, calm down a little bit quiet down, get by with a little bit less, and live a simple life. And How we can radical do this. is that idea? It's very radical, but economists have thought about it in really interesting terms. One of the things that's going on, and the, the, the fact that we need economic growth is so we can have full employment. Well, we need to do that because of things like robots, putting people out of work, and, and increased productivity. Well, the other way to do that is to cut working hours. <laughs> I say, no, we're not going to work 40 hour a week. We're going to work a 30 hour a week and make the same money from here on in. Mm-hmm. And, and that's pretty easy. And then the rest of the time you spend on things like going hunting and fishing or education and spend time with your family, that stuff. That's completely doable. And they are doing it in Europe. They're starting to cut working hours and, and, and they're also living quite well. Quite mm-hmm. well and quite, and they're happier than we are and healthier we are in most of Europe on, on a zero growth economy in some places. And they're, you know, they're in half a percent, one percent, where we think we got to be three percent a year. Right. So you gradually dial that down and you gradually back off some landscape and not turn to turn the volume up all the way. And, and like I was talking about, reserving public lands so they're, um, uh, yeah, 30% of our landscape is preserved in some way. Those kinds of measures can, over the course of several generations, actually reverse the problems we're in. Right. I would say, too, with that 30%, um, you don't, you're not giving much up because I was thinking about the, between just just the wildlife refuge system. Right. Um, the the floodplains that we already have, right. um, and the floodplains that are we're 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 we've ruined and are now paying over and over that we could actually bring into this. Correct. I don't think you'd give up much. No, you give up almost nothing, especially because we have so much public land in this country. Right. So we're almost in the West. We are more than thirty percent public land. So all we got to do is stop. Um, b- b- turning to profit on those lands and simply say, no, we're going to restore. We're doing restoration ecology right. on those landscapes. They're for wildlife. They're for humans to to go into and learn as we use wilderness now. And they're for flood control and right. water quality control and carbon sequestration. So in this, so I've got that crew where I work with every year redoing the, uh, re- trying to restore the sage on those big fires in Idaho. Yeah. And, we have created an economic engine there that I'm really proud of. People yeah. are getting paid well to plant sagebrush seedlings in hard country. It's a hard job. There you go. You know, and uh, <laughs> somebody's an elephant has just crossed the roof. <laughs> but people, but I, I believe that I was, I've, I am coming to believe that there's a restoration economy. You know that that. Could you could almost have your cake and eat it too as oh, far absolutely. as jobs go? Absolutely, because like absolutely. we said, there's no jobs and the, there's just no employment in what I'm watching, what we're doing. Yeah, exactly. There's so no, there there's enormous opportunity there in in restoration ecology. We just go to work. You can imagine 
Iowa, for instance, employing a bunch of people, first of all, to require, acquire the landscape and then start planting perennial grasses in places for flood control as opposed to farming every square inch of the land. Yeah, this would but, bring commodity prices up to where the farmers could actually make some dollars on the yeah. ground they keep. Or we not put 40% of what they're growing now into gas tanks. We do not need that right. in gas tanks. They're being subsidized to do that. We yeah. can simply say, no, we're going to do a diverse agriculture. We're going to do some grass-fed beef, for instance, as opposed to the feedlot stuff that we're doing now. When you're running chainsaw now, don't you go buy that premix, no ethanol? <laughs> do you? Yeah, everybody yeah, I does. Do. Yeah, for, everybody for, does. Yeah, I've yeah. got a steel weed eater. Yeah. And I brought a, an ice auger yeah. back from the dead with that premix, yeah. no ethanol gas. So I'm paying like $18, $20 a gallon for this so I don't have to buy the stuff at the pump that destroyed my ice auger. Well, now, now, I was blown away by that. <laughs> look at the parallel of that in your body. And the, the, the food that you are forced to eat, if you eat it a standard American diet, is exactly the same problem. It's causing... Gotcha. <laughs> it's, it's the same thing you're burning in your personal gas tank that is yeah. causing you worse problems because it's that corn and corn that they can't sell. So they're right. going to put it into your body in some other way. As R- corn syrup. Sure. It's eroding all your gaskets. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Do you uh, have you come to see the world um, as just an ecological? I mean, like like when you're in your brain, which is probably a hard place to be. Do you do you see the world like everything? Do you see the connections after after so many years of of making these deep research? Yeah. Yeah, you really do. Um, it, it, God, it was Aldo Leopold, I think, who said the price of an ecological education is to live in a, alone in a world of wounds. Of wounds, right. That's it. And 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 and, and, and that's what happens. You sure. just if once you're educated to these issues, you see the problems. That's what happened to me on that drive to Ulm. Yeah, yeah. You know, it really it really was. And my, I guess, and I, and because we're in this pandemic, because we're in this time with the protests in the streets, I just passed the guys in Missoula. Um, you know, I I, I have I'm going to say this. I'm going to live alone in a world of wounds, but I'm going to be happy anyway. Yeah. That, that's like I'm not going to let that run me off the bridge. I've, I, I, these days, I've been reading a lot of history, and I'm reading like you do, reading history of the Civil War, for instance, or World War II in Europe, and what people went through during those right. periods. And it says, you know, it's never been a bed of roses here. <laughs> right, it really have. People right. have suffered greatly, and we're not suffering greatly. Right at the moment, some of us are. We actually, Some people have, in the country they are, are for sure. But yeah. we actually have the time. We have yeah. the moment, the wiggle room That's right. moment. That's and, right. Um, one of the and against the grain um, is your book on how. how Agriculture has hijacked civilization, but the the account of those famines in in your book against the grain yeah. is really one of the more terrifying pieces of prose that I've ever read. Yeah, yeah, famines terrifying thing, and it's it's within our lifetimes. Yeah, I mean the Chinese starved to death seventy million people. We think during the Great Leap Forward, which is you know nineteen sixties yeah. that period, they yeah. hit it, and then we couldn't. But seventy million people, seventy million people. Yeah, and imagine the suffering. And I was, and you're you're talking about the Ukrainian, yeah, one, and yeah. um, the, yeah. and I was I was remembering um, Lysenko. Remember him in Russia? Yeah, he absolutely. made up quack crackpot agricultural theories. Yeah, it was kind of like rain follows the That's plow, right. but on steroids. That's right. Yeah, wasn't that? And they called it Lysenkoism. Yeah. To, to make up a crackpot theory and then make everybody do it. Yeah, because right? they had a totalitarian system. Same in China. Yeah. Same deal. Yeah, and they paper would, mache produce. Yeah, 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 yeah. Propaganda, and that's, yeah. that's why we should be wary of propaganda. And it's, yeah. we're not immune from it in our country right now. Oh. <laughs> there's quite <laughs> would, a bit. Of I would say we're 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 in the in the heat of it. Yeah, I mean, you have a you have a passage in there where um, they've doctored a photo for a guy standing on amber waves of grain as if he's uh, uh, walking on water. Yeah, to show to Mao, Chairman Mao, to say that the, his methods were working. Yeah. Yeah. If he was walking out, the grain was so dense they could walk on top of it. That was the idea. Right. And it didn't exist at all. It didn't exist at all. People were starving to death. That, that's the exact period when they starved to death. Right. 70 million people. So um, I'm going to go to another inconvenient place while we're here. Can we do what we need to do without a draconian, too powerful government? 
Uh, government's going to have a huge role in it. And we need to have government participate. And it goes back to what I was talking about. The, the war that, that we're losing right now is, is the war against public space and public lands. Well, that's when we come together as people, we come together in government. And we need to stop this nonsense of vilifying government and thinking government is evil when it is government who, that can um, uh, preserve and protect our public lands and do really um, important things there. It's the only thing that has. That's right. That's, it, what, that's what I keep coming back ever, to. Yeah. Ever. Right. And, and so, and, and the economists have looked at this very closely, and even in places that are real prosperous around the world, and there are prosperous countries, and then there's countries that are failing. There's no such thing as a country that does not have a strong economy and doesn't have strong government. Mm-hmm. You, you need to have a both. They go together as balancing forces, countervailing forces. And we've lost that balance in this country. And as a result, we're losing our public space and our, and, and, and our resiliency. That's where it comes from, our reserve. Because there's no profit motive in educating people. Right. There's no profit motive in pr- pr- preserving the landscape or making sure we have abundant elk herds and things like that. And so those things that don't have a profit motive, we have to then do as collectively as people. We say, no, we got together and did that. Just like people used to get together and, 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 and build the town hall years right, ago. Sure. That's sure. fine. Let's do those things and understand there's a place for cooperation and there's a place for separateness. There are balancing forces and we have to balance those things. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I, and I think we're, I mean, what we're seeing on, a, on some of what I've seen on the federal level is the abdication of that idea, right? Yeah. And it starts breaking down. Eventually you break down your military. Yeah. And eventually you, you have, like, I, I, I spent time in El Salvador as a kid, you know, and um, it was during the troubles, and, yeah. and the troubles were terrible. The, so there was a failed civil war. Yeah. And um, that, to me, I have never, I never realized how impressed that, that what what that experience was like. Yeah. Until much older, because I felt like our country was. Uh, I didn't think we were immune to that. Yeah. But I never thought I would see people talking the same about the government as yeah. they did there, where the government truly was authoritarian and murderous. Yeah. Exactly so. And right. you cannot allow it to slip to that. Yeah. And it has to be representative. And it has to put sideboards on some of the economic endeavors, yeah. right? Yeah. I spent about 10 years working in the developing world and researching why was people were starving to death. And in the end, it was because their governments failed. Right. And so all of Africa starves to death because there's not a single good government in all of Africa. And and, and nobody can get beyond that problem. Well, we need not go there we need to right. be competent government yeah and we we have had it at times oh we've had yeah, yeah. And, 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 and in fact it was the time that when people talk about making america great again they're talking about the 1950s when, when in fact it was great i mean economically people were better off they had education something like per in a per capita basis something like triple the people were worked for the federal government then as work for the federal government now mm-hmm. the Federal government was triple the size in the 1950s as what as it is today. Well, and and so uh, we can say, well, okay, that's part of making America great again. Right. A, just, a good, strong yeah. government. I just remember people coming out of the Forest Service who had uh, the tree planting was done in house. Yeah, by by people uh-huh. who are proud of that to be in the Forest Service and plant the trees. By the time I came along, that was all contracted out. Yeah. Right. And then I and then I lived through where it was contracted to the illegals, which put the the tree planters out of business. And then, I mean, that was that was a for a, a budget deal, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we talked. I've written about this, and we talked about it. But uh, so all right. So I've got I've got a one last thing. I want I want to I want to go ten or fifteen minutes, whatever it takes. But I you we're going to talk about building resilience on public land. Yeah. And and I wanted you to just kind of give me your ideas of what what that would look like. A vision for public lands in the next 35, 40 years. Yeah. So you begin with restoration ecology. So you, uh, you, you understand that public lands are depleted in some areas. And you, you got to evaluate them. And we have the tools to do that. We can do it acre by acre. We know what's in good shape. We know what's in bad shape. We know what's in trouble. We know where the exotic species are, all those things. We know where fire suppression has created enormous problems and where, where fire regime has been restored and we've gotten better. Uh, we do that inventory right away and we say, what's in bad shape? And we fix it. And we do everything we can to fix it. In some places you can't. 
And then you do some further inventories. You say, okay, what what do we own, or what do we own as a, the public and riparian zones, and what can we do with flood control landscapes now, not dams and canals and stuff, landscape improvements that make wetlands and right. so forth. What do we need to acquire? So, I was, for instance, I was covering the, the flooding in uh, Iowa one time. This is a generation ago flooding, or not a generation ago, 15 years maybe. And I talked to, I interviewed people there, and they said, you know, if we had 10% of our landscape in permanent grassland, we would not have this problem. Right. And they said, and we can show you right here on the GIS maps where we want to do this, where we could do it, and we could stop the flooding that was costing billions of dollars right. a year. Right. So we, we do that inventory, and we acquire those lands as rapidly as possible. We figure out creative ways to pay farmers. Because we're paying for them anyway. That's right. Yeah. And so we turn around, we pay those same farmers. We say, okay, we want you to put grassland there. And by the way, you can graze some beef on there if you want to, and right. you can make a little profit off it. So Look, we're doing incentive-based incentive, incentive based change. Yes. Yeah. Incentive-based. We work with farmers. We work. We buy land, fee simple, when we need to. And what we, does fee simple mean? That you own it. We own it. Okay. And, and if we don't own it, we might do um, things like uh, easements and all those tools we have. We have an enormous number of tools to influence how we occupy land and how land is done. And then we start fixing those things. We stop oil and gas drilling on public lands completely. We stop m mineral development on public lands completely because they're not compatible. compatible. Some logging we can do and some fire restoration work. I was going to ask, stuff. is there some grazing and some logging in this sure. in this picture? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in some places, grazing actually helps. You can restore sure. the landscape with grazing if you do a good job with it. If you understand how it's done. Uh, we can do experiments on BLM land, for instance, with managed um, intentional ro rotational grazing, those systems that mimic bison and cause that. La and when we do that, that landscape sequesters carbon much more rapidly than forests do. So everything that we can do to build topsoil sequesters carbon, and that's the one, one goal that we really have in a big way. And we figure out ways to do that. So, and, and, and it's, we're talking about generations of projects. The specifics are um, uh, of each plot of land is, is locally determined, understood. We think about it. We think about it. We use the best science we, we have to bring that landscape back to what it was pre-settlement in some way to do those ecosystem surfaces we're, we're, we, we need. Yep. But the biggest goal is sequestering carbon. How, we, we stop developing oil and gas on them, so we're putting less in the, land, in the, in the atmosphere to begin with. Right. And by the way, fracking puts a whole lot of carbon in the air. So we stop doing that. And at the same time, we figure out ways to make um, the, the, the vegetation there sequester carbon, build Good. topsoil, those things. Um, can you sell a post oil and gas um, economy? Can well, you sell it to the people? No, we might not. We, we, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, but, but it doesn't matter. We're going to need one anyhow. So at some point, it, it's going to become a necessity, and in those places where we have the political will to do it, we start doing it. We start the experiments. We start the demonstration, the proof of concept stuff that needs to happen. And then you're not telling people, you're showing them. There you say, go. This is, no, this is what we accomplished here. And by the way, people are pretty happy with the way this turned out. Yeah. We're getting along better in this community. We like what we're doing. We're proud of this work. Uh, th my experience in Iowa was that way, that you expect to go in, farming communities, bringing these radical ideas in, and they're going to they're gonna holler at you because they want to farm. And some of that does happen. But some, of them, some people get real interested. They say, you know, it's been kind of boring lately. And there's a lot of chemistry here that we we really would rather not have. And, my, and Grandma just died of cancer, and, and so did Grandpa, and we think that's a bad idea. And So let's do something more interesting. And they have such groundwater problems, and, yeah, and there's so, such a lack of uh, infiltration of water into those old aquifers yeah. because of the sealed, uh, the plowed ground, yeah. and the, the, grass, the grass infiltrates water and the plowed ground doesn't. Yeah. I mean, that's just like... At, and people, people who work, uh, maybe not if you're a giant corporation doing agriculture, but people I know who farm, say, 250 acres in Alabama, they get, they know all of that. Yeah. Because they're yeah. out there every day working on it. Yeah, exactly yeah. so. And then and, 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 and they enjoy the work in some ways of what I'm talking about, yeah. the, the restoration work. Even uh, some of the best restoration ecology that's been done in Montana have been done by former loggers. 
and and the loggers understand how to do this and it's actually a kind of an interesting challenge yep. to do a thinning project as opposed to taking in a feller buncher and doing a clear cut on the side right. of a mountain right. and it brings their skills into play and there's and they take pride in it when they walk away at the end of the day and that's the kind of thing i'm talking about we can yep. take some pride in this work yeah and I, I would say, I mean, it's such a luxury to have. Not luxury. It's thank God we've got that public land to, to operate with. You well, know? that's it. And it, that's what the Europeans don't have. That's right. We have this enormous legacy. And, and when you think about it, the, the guy who gave it to us or gave us a big chunk of it, Teddy Roosevelt, thought about it in exactly these terms. It was, it was a place of resilience for watershed protection and timber. Yeah, he thought about that, but also about resilience for the American spirit where we right. could go back there and reconstruct our communities in ways that were meaningful by our attachment to the landscape. And that to me is the most exciting part of this. We can stop fighting over it and understand that no, we have this big job to do. Let's, let's, let's bring our public lands into it. Yeah. And in the end, we got a place that we can all enjoy, hunt in, fish in, and take great pride in the fact that, yeah, the elk herd's abundant here and it wasn't right. before. That's right. a cool thing. Right. And imagine being able to fish like I always really, really lost its fishing. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. imagine being back on the Raccoon River or the Des Moines River catching catfish on trot line and, yeah. and spending all night on a sandbar, you know? Yeah. I got two stories from Iowa that are relevant to that. And one, I was doing um, a piece on uh, water pollution there, and I interviewed a bunch of uh, hunters. And they were they're pretty good pheasant population in places. And they said, oh, yeah, well, but when we hunt now, we can't let our dogs drink. Because they'll die. They'll die. Oh. Just drinking from the, from the water in the area. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine that no. as a Montanan? No. The other story I had was years ago when I was doing grassland, they were doing a tall grass restoration project just outside of Des Moines, Iowa, putting together this enormous prairie that's now finished, by the way, and it's, it's gorgeous. I've been there since. But um, I, I interviewed Who people. Who owns that? It's it's just federal land. It gotcha. Will, yeah. So it's an uh, uh, the um, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service manages it. And it's the Neil something. I've forgotten the guy's wow. last name now. The Prairie Reserve. And they they bought farms and then restored them to prairie. And I interviewed people in Iowa about it, and they said, you know, before we always had to go to Yellowstone Park, drive clear out there to see nature. There's no nature in Iowa. <laughs> right. And now they have nature. Right. In Iowa. Right. And and they took a lot of pride in that. And, I bet. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, was, I noticed one time on that Nature Conservancy project in the tall grass, um, there's, there were so many bugs, so many butterflies and things that I had never seen before anywhere in my life. Yeah. There was horned toads on the road. There were box turtles going back and forth like, like, as, like commuters. I mean, um, to see it, it's the, it's the Aldo Leopold quote for sure yeah. after you see yeah. what, what really is there. But um, I've never forgotten that. Like, like to see those, those hummingbird moths. And these stingless bees, which I've only yeah. seen one time before, and that was in the Selway Wilderness. Yeah. And there were thousands of them. Yeah. 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 There's a guy, a guy named Monbiol who just, uh, he's a British ecologist, and he just wrote a book about restoration ecology in the UK. We, they call it rewilding there, and they're okay. doing it. But the name of the book is The Moth Snowstorm. Uh -huh. And when he was growing up, there were moth snowstorms. Yeah. In the UK, which no longer exists. Yeah. England no longer has that many gotcha. insects. And that's what he's talking about, restoring the moth snowstorm. Well, yeah, I, I read him in The Guardian sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what, yeah. yeah. Well, any any final thoughts? Where, do you, what are you gonna do? where are you working on now in this summertime, well, pandemic summer? Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about the degrowth movement. I'm going to take a look at it, how it's developing in Europe, which is much more pronounced there and see if we have applications to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and what we ought to be doing. To, but also... Are you to, going to Europe for this? Yeah, if I can if travel. Can. Well, we yeah. can travel. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I'd like to go to Europe because uh, they have a lot we can learn from there. And mostly what attracts me to Europe is the fact that people are quite happy there. If you know, they do all sorts of happiness surveys and health surveys. <laughs> right, I've seen them, yeah. They live longer yeah. than we do, and they're happier, and they have yeah. less money. And then that's where we need to go. We need to figure yeah. that out in some way. Mm-hmm. When, um, if you can't travel, what do you do here? Well, I, I read a lot. I, I read way too much. But that, 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 that's uh, but a writer's life 
is being a hermit, essentially. And now sure. they call it social distancing. So right. I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. it looks exactly, my day looks the same as it did for years Right, and years. for sure. Yeah. For sure. Are you reading anything that you'd recommend or is it all uh, research stuff? I just read The Odyssey. Uh, wow. <laughs> and and I would recommend that. And yeah. the, the oldest story in humanity that we've been telling these stories for a whole bunch of years. And, and I thought that was, that was, I spent a lot of time reading history as well. Because yeah. it's the only way I get through these times is to understand that it's always been a tussle. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's always been a tussle. Yeah. If you expect it to be easy, you're going to, that disappointment is going to be your, your uh, fate. That's right. I was, I listened to the Odyssey through the floor in my house. My son played it. Oh, they had wow. the whole thing on tape. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, he's way more conversant with the Odyssey than I am. Wow. But I'll, I, I'll take that as a recommendation. Yeah. Thank you, Dick. Thank I'm, you. I it's really appreciate this, here, man. Hal. This is awesome. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Hey, this has been uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Podcast and Blast. I'm Hal Herring. We're signing off for this one, but we'll be back in a week or 10 days. In the meantime, uh, check out backcountryhunters.org. Get some more podcasts there and see what we're up to. And uh, also, I'm going to be out there wandering around, hunting and fishing, wearing out a pair of boots. And I hope you'll be doing the same thing. We're living in God's pocket, and we need to celebrate that. Never forget it. And get out there and and live it and enjoy it. Hey, thanks a lot, everybody. Talk soon.